Welcome to the Brooklyn Rails 320th New Social Environment. I am Nick Bennett, the special project editor here at The Rail, and I have the pleasure and privilege of being your MC today for a conversation between Laurent Grasso and Donation Grau. We're also thrilled to have the poet Sandra Simons here, who will read to close today's program. We have started all of our events here with two important acknowledgments. The first is that here in New York, we are on Lenape Hoking, the unceded land and waters of the Wappinger, Canarsie, Muncie, and Lenny Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and Shinnecock Indian Nation. The second is an acknowledgement that Black Lives Matter. The heart of both of these acknowledgements is a commitment to the liberation of the oppressed and solidarity for all who struggle for freedom and recognition that when it comes to liberation, our histories never unfold in isolation. In that spirit, I encourage you all to check out the chat for a living document of resources and actions that I will post in just a moment. Uh, and now to introduce today's guest and host. Born in 1972, French conceptual artist Laurent Grasso creates mysterious atmospheres through immersive and labyrinthine installations that challenge the boundaries of our perceptions and knowledge. Combining the most prospective theories and scientific tools with the oldest beliefs, his works invite us to travel through time and into an interfolding of worlds. Our host for today is Head of Contemporary Programs at the Musée, Musée d'Orsay in Paris, Donation Grau, holds doctoral degrees in French and comparative literature, in philological and historical sciences, and a doctor of philosophy from various institutions. He is an editor at large for Purple Magazine and the Brooklyn Rail. And uh, I will note, we will post full bios for today's guest and host in the chat. But for now, I pass the mic over to you, Donation. Thank you so much, Nick. It's a great pleasure to be uh, to kind of to return on this program and to have um, as my guest, uh, Laurent Gasso. Uh, you know, I met I have been familiar with Laurent's work for a very long time um, because he's an extraordinary artist who has blended the borders of representation, beliefs, you know, the what you can say, and we'll be talking about this, what you can say about, um, you know, the thought and the thought process that uh, is underscores uh, his work uh, is also what you can say about his practice of images. And he's a genius at creating extraordinary uh, sensorial uh, experiences with images and with just perception. And so I had been very, had been a great fan of his work. And four years ago, I was hired by my current boss, uh, the director and CEO of the Musée d'Orsay et de l'Orangerie, Laurence, Laurence Descartes. And she said to me, oh, I've been having this conversation with uh, Laurent Gasso about doing a project that was four years ago. And four years in the making, the project is now right now on, uh, in the name of the Musée d'Orsay, you'll see a rendering right behind me and you'll see more, uh, it's an old rendering and you'll see more uh, in the minutes to come. Mm -hmm. And it's been uh, an extraordinary uh, journey to uh, work on this project with Laurent, uh, you know, for four years, which ended up being this film, Artificialis, that is screened in the nave uh, of the Musée d'Orsay at the very end of the nave and that was made to concur uh, with the exhibition, uh, The Origins of the World, The Invention of Nature in the 19th Century, created by Laura Bossi here at the Musée d'Orsay. And, um, and as we were, uh, and this project is at the same time a film, uh, but it's also an installation that reverberates uh, across, across the nave. And, um, you know, it's been made possible by the extraordinary support of our wonderful American friends, the American friends of the Musée d'Orsay, L'Orangerie, and here we're able to fully exploit, uh, fully use what is what was, as you may know, one of the early inspirations for the Taiwan Hall. You know, one of the early inspirations for the Taiwan Hall for the neighbor of the Musée d'Orsay, but with that extraordinary negative space of the two mastabas uh, that we never really use as an institution. And finally, uh, you know, through this journey, we we ended up using it, and Laurent has made it into a magnificent space for experiences. All that's to say that we've been working together for four years and have learned to um, discover and experience the extraordinary breadth of Laurent's uh, mind and, uh, and his extraordinary ability at creating, uh, at creating experiences in artwork. So I felt when I was thinking about the next uh, conversation we could have, um, you know, here at the Book and Rail with my um, hat, 
uh, as uh, of editor at large, I felt they would make would be really interesting to to invite Laurent and to have a sort of formal informal uh, conversation in which we could talk about many of his themes. And you know, part of all of this thought is that Laurent is an artist who is very prominent, of course, in France, but also in the United States. He works. He worked with the old time John Kelly Gallery, and um, and it felt that uh, many of our friends in the United States would not be able to see uh, Laurence's extraordinary project. So we felt that it would be, uh, it would be a strong, an important thing and a compelling thing to, um, you know, to, to just have a discussion. Uh, and that's what we're about to do. So the idea that we're going to start talking about uh, artificialis and the premises of the project, and you'll be seeing some images of it, you'll be among the very few people, for those of you who are in the United States, we will have seen images of it, uh, and because it is something to experience here in Paris, um, and then we'll be dwelling upon certain themes of, of Laurence's uh, work. Uh, but my first question, maybe to you, Laurent, is that um, when we started this conversation, the very conversation you had with Laurence Legal was to um, and re-enchant the nave, that was the phrase you both of you used. And then the project morphed to also be in dialogue with this extraordinary exhibition dedicated to the transformation of the concept of nature in the 19th century. So what we have now is at the same time a re-enchantment of the nave, as well as uh, a dialogue with certain themes of the exhibition. So, uh, so my question to you is how much of it is a re-enchantment of the nave and an installation? How much of it is a film in relation with the context, content, and ideas? Thank you very much, Donatia. Thank you for this invitation. Um, the, the process of my work is uh, investigating uh, any uh, situation um, with different channels. What I like uh, when I'm invited by uh, an institution or a, a gallery or any kind of, uh, any kind of situation, um, I like to take a lot of information and to, to do a lot of research. And uh, it could be about the history of the place, but also some completely alternative uh, history. And uh, Orsay, of course, the first, um, the, the first inspiration was the space itself and its history. And the, let's say like almost the volume uh, and the, the architecture. Uh, and this nave is really impressive uh, for an artist. Uh, um, and uh, we started to imagine uh, a few kind of projects, completely different, of course, from the movies that we finally uh, have done. And it was a very interesting uh, process because um, we developed very different, uh, very different type of exhibition. Finally, um, I saw that uh, the, the pra my, my practice is based is, uh, on um, my film project. They are a kind of uh, matrix of the other artwork coming most of the time afterwards, the creation of the movie itself. So we decided to, uh, to do a new movie, basically. And uh, in the meantime, um, the the schedule, the program of uh, the Musée d'Orsay uh, has developed and um, we uh, decided with Laurence Descartes and Donatien to uh, do a project uh, in connection with um, the actual exhibition. Uh, uh, and uh, the, it's not the central point of the exhibition, but I was really uh, interested and influenced by uh, Darwin and the notion of exploration. Um, the, the idea also that the nature was a concept invented in the 19th century and that this concept has uh, changed today. And uh, the, the work I've tried to, to I, I, I tried to, I had, to create was 
also to show all this concept uh, um, was different today. So about the nave and the reenchantment of the, the, the nave, uh, I think uh, a lot of uh, the a lot of the content of the project is also about the sound. And this is something really interesting that we have uh, succeeded to do is to uh, have the sound of the movie uh, in the entire museum. So there is something really interesting because um, the movie itself, the screen that we installed, but also the sound is uh, modifying the way we are uh, visiting the museum and seeing the collection. And for me, this is really interesting because I, I work a lot with the modified state of conscience. Uh, uh, I think that uh, my films are not just movie, but they are also signal. And um, this is something that I'm very happy uh, to, 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 uh, to have um, achieved with, uh, with the team. Maybe, and then we're going to maybe going to play a clip and show you some images of the film, but maybe it would be great, Laurent, to, for you to tell us about the journey, you know, that led you through the conception of this work. Yes. Um, the, as I said, I was influenced by um, the idea of exploration. What could we explore today? Is the notion of explorer, of exploration, still something active and interesting? And how would uh, explore uh, a character like Darwin today with what kind of tools? And um, is it uh, still necessary to move around the world or to be in a laboratory and to analyze uh, that data? So um, um, the, the, the first uh, question and the first, um, the, the starting point of the project was this notion of exploration. One other interest I had was about the tools. Um, uh, What's the difference, you know, between the beagle of Darwin, his boat, uh, and the, what kind of vessel we uh, we could use today, and um, what would be the, the kind of navigation, and what's the, what's the necessity to still travel and explore geographically uh, the Earth? So I start to collect a lot of uh, videos in. Um, some uh, very uh, famous uh, uh, data center. And I start to, to buy a few uh, videos to do a kind of scouting, like a kind of virtual uh, scouting for my project. And I was also interested by um, very specific uh, images. Like I was looking for, um, around this idea of artificiality, I was looking for uh, natural picture looking uh, unreal or uh, not natural and natural and artificial uh, uh, installation or modification by a uh, human being. And um, I was playing with this idea of um, natural and virtual. So at one point, um, I had like many, many videos and I had to, to choose a different location where we plan to travel and to, 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 to shoot. Usually uh, I work with a team of uh, five to 15 people and we are traveling together in a very specific location. One of the last shooting I've done, it was for the Sydney Biennale and we went there in the middle of the desert, uh, living with a community um, for uh, three weeks. And uh, it was a very strong, uh, a very strong moment. So um, here we we were really like in uh, in February, and we start to point very specific location where we were supposed to to travel, um, especially uh, Svalbard, a small island uh, near the North Pole. And of course, um, we the, the lockdown started in, uh, in in France, 
and uh, all over the world. So we were not able to, to travel uh, anymore. And it was a very interesting moment because in a way, um, in this moment, a lot of people mentioned this idea of the virtuality of the culture. And um, actually, uh, it was also an interesting moment for my movie, for my project, because I had this very difficult time where I had to choose between 50 uh, interesting uh, locations. So uh, I decided not to travel because anyway, it was not possible, but even not to postpone the, the, the travel and the shooting, but rather to do the project with all the videos that I have bought. And that was the, the, the starting point of the, the, the construction of this project. I think I also, you know, one thing you say is that you went through these different materials and I think it's interesting to, for us to sort of guide us more through these materials and what you did to them, because I once made um, a comment that amused you and, and, you know, and in a way that challenged you, which is that for me, uh, the way you've used images is similar to Marcel Duchamp's uh, LHOQ in the sense that the face of the Mona Lisa, he draws the moustache and then he also seemingly invisibly draws the eyelids. Uh, but of course, we don't really see it. And a number of those images are images you found and they're ready-made images. A number of others are images you transformed. And the status of the image between transformed image, not na natural image, whatever, whatever that means, or original image, or whatever that means, is very, very interesting. And for me, your film is indeed about the transformations of nature, or what we used to call nature, but it's as much about the status of the image. And I would love to hear you talk a little bit about it. Yes, um, it's, it's funny because when we mention this idea to uh, work with um, ready-made uh, videos and to uh, uh, found a picture, uh, it could uh, remind a kind of a YouTube aesthetic, you know, but actually um, we, I've done this, this research in a very uh, scientific uh, way. Uh, we collaborate with different research programs to buy some pictures some different, of different phenomenon of different places. And also we started to use uh, very interesting and new tools like here, the picture uh, we share is a picture done with um, a LiDAR uh, scanner. So it's a, it's a new kind of scanner able to uh, do a scanner of landscape of an object and um, it has helped uh, scientists to discover some uh, rooms and some also um, like for example under the, oce the ocean it was possible to uh, discover some specific uh, very old places. So uh, LiDAR is a kind of um, addition to our uh, visible um, field. And uh, for me, it's really interesting because also, uh, so basically it's a, it's a machine that you, um, that, uh, you can install in different location of one big place. And after you have a file and you can navigate uh, inside of this file like uh, you could navigate in a kind of virtual, um, uh, in a kind of virtual uh, uh, place, but it's real. It's made from the reality. Uh, so uh, the, the simple fact to be able to uh, do a scanner of a place, of a forest or of the North Pole is very interesting, but also uh, the object um, become transparent and you can really go uh, through an object. And this is also really interesting because it produces a new kind of uh, uh, image and uh, videos. Um, so, so this is for just one, one uh, type of um, image in the, in the project. But uh, 
We also um, collected very interesting uh, drone uh, uh, videos and uh, I work on um, spe special effects on different uh, places that we superimpose with uh, different places. Um, maybe we could show um, a short um, excerpt to, 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 to share a bit. Um, Sure. Would we would we like to share the overview of the turbine hall, or would you like to share the the excerpt from the video? Uh, from the video, maybe. Cool. We'll uh, right now. Uh, with the fire. So I mean, there are many things I want to ask you, Laurent, still about that, but maybe one thing we should talk about, and I think that's also very interesting, is how a project of yours functions uh, like a galaxy, you know, in the sense that there is a centerpiece, which is the film, and then there are many works that stem from it, and we'll see some of them later. It's also a collaborative platform, you know, in the sense that you are the artist, but for example, the music you just heard was commissioned by Laurent to Warren Ellis, a great uh, Australian musician. And, um, you know, and, and we have uh, concurrently with Laurent's project, we have a, a display, a parcours across the collections of decorative arts by the great graphic designers, um, m, m Paris, and then Laurent, you invited them to work with you on, on the end of the film, on, on the generic, as we say in French. Um, and so you, it's really interesting for me because it feels that there is this way you work and you know, with a gathering of images, with a gathering of a collaboration, with your work, it feels that the way you work is creating in a galaxy, from a galaxy, a galaxy. What are your thoughts about that? Yes, um, the, another interesting uh, word would be a constellation. Um, I work with, um, first of all, I, I have a studio with uh, between five and 10 people uh, working with me. And uh, it allowed me to have a conversation and to do some research and also to 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 work uh, in a very um, very specific uh, way um, i have like for example three architects working with me so we have really um, the capacity and the sense to analyze uh, the space and to create specific installation but after, for a project like that, I collaborated also, for example, with Gregory Kenneth. He's a researcher, is an historian of the history uh, of the environment. And uh, we had a long conversation together, an ongoing uh, conversation since maybe uh, six years. And um, he introduced me to different tools, to different concepts. And um, we have, uh, yeah, we have this way to uh, to just have this conversation, but uh, without any uh, real uh, goal. Uh, it's something completely uh, free. But also, um, for uh, each project, I have a team, uh, a new team for each project regarding the kind of uh, uh, techniques and the kind of location. 
So uh, this is for the uh, for the fabrication, for the creation of the project, but also about the galaxy of the object. Um, the movie are generating some object. It could be a painting, it could be a, a sculptures, um, neon. And um, I like this idea that, um, and generally sometimes they are exhibited in the, in the same uh, place, but uh, not for Orsay. For Orsay it was interesting because um, I had uh, uh, three shows uh, in Asia. And um, so the, 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 the other side of my project uh, um, was exhibited in uh, different uh, places and galleries uh, in uh, Asia, in Korea, in Hong Kong and Shanghai also. So uh, this object, um, for example, uh, I think we have a picture some, somewhere, but I created this uh, future herbarium project. Um, it's a, a series of uh, uh, flowers uh, with a different kind of uh, mutations. And uh, um, it's, the, it, it's about the idea of um, flowers of the futures. Uh, maybe we could uh, we could show uh, a few of these paintings. There are somewhere. No, uh, after. Uh, it's before. Future herbarium. Yeah, here you have the painting, but it's not really uh, visible. Yeah, the the first um, the first the first picture of time travel. Yes, forty five. Thank you very much. So here you can see a few of these paintings, and for me they are really related to the movie Artificialis. Um, and I like this idea that uh, this painting or different objects are really coming through the screen. Um, I, like the, the, I like to imagine that you have some <laughs> flying object, uh, uh, but also I like to play with this déjà vu um, effect of um, a viewer somewhere uh, and um, a picture, one element in the movie, but after the same information, the same object uh, in the exhibition space uh, somewhere else. So I like to create this kind of constellation of uh, movie and object and um, to, uh, to create uh, some link and also to play with uh, the notion of time uh, because generally, um, I use another time frame to represent uh, element of the of the movie. For example, here, um, these paintings they are made in the in a 18th century style of the herbarium, and uh, but they are representing flowers of the future. So I like this uh, way to mix different temporalities to to create also this object and to blur a bit more the <laughs> the, the, the 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 project and the, the feeling about my work another thing i want to talk about is um the idea of heightened sensation which i think for me is really a key to understand all your work um you know in the sense that at times in the late afternoon, when I walk across the nave and I see, I see people almost lying, you know, on benches in front of your film, and, and you know, it's almost as if the nave of the Musée d'Orsay mm -hmm. were going to turn into a Woodstock of sorts, and um, and that you're creating through your work almost an experience of being high, and that relates to sensation in a way and playing with sensation. And for me, there's a tension in your work between something that is pictorial in itself, you know, creating an image, playing with images as we can see through these works, 
It's also very close with the film. And that is something also that is very clear in the nave because you know we have three very large paintings, two by Courbet, one by Thomas Couture, and then your film right now. So there's a pictorial and there's playing with the sensation, which you do in across your art. And already you did in your graduation project at the Bazaar when you created a nightclub in the basement of the Bazaar. So right. for me, there's this tension in your work between pictorial and sensorial. And I would love to hear you talk more about it, please. Thank you. Uh, yes. Um... I see, for example, the screen in the nave of Orsay, um, and the screen is uh, generating different kind of uh, signal. Um, the very informative uh, uh, signal, like we can recognize the object uh, we are uh, we are seeing, uh, but also another kind of um, another kind of signal is a kind of sensorial signal. Um, this idea that um, uh, a video, a movie, is also made by colors, made by um, motion, and also especially for myself, the motion of the of the camera and uh, of shape. And um, I like to to play also as well with this um, power of the cinema and the moving picture. Uh, so the the abstract part of uh, one picture. And this is something um, I try to, to, to work with, is that uh, one movie is representing something. So I choose carefully the, the content and the subject, but it's also the way uh, and the way it's filmed and the, the kind of um, work. This is a work of any, uh, uh, photo director or a movie uh, maker is a way to, to, to film the object. But also, I work a lot with the concept of invisibility and immateriality. And I see also um, the screen and all the machine I'm using in my different exhibition as uh, uh, some tools to uh, spread some frequency or some waves or some uh, uh, invisible signal. Um, one of the last projects I've done, and we could show a few pictures, um, is in Tarbes in South of France, where I organize a project. The title of the project is 7.83. And it's about um, the frequencies of uh, Schumann. Uh, maybe we could show a few pictures of this installation. It's at the beginning. Um, yes. So uh, this is a very uh, strange uh, machine. It's uh, inspired by um, a drawing by Rudolf Steiner. And um, this machine is supposed to transmit energy from one uh, human being to one other. And um, of course, um, uh, for an artist, it's really interesting. And I've been, uh, uh, I spent a lot of time to look for strange practices, strange beliefs, and um, but always with this possible oscillation towards something scientific. I think that any important scientific discovery started with something really strange and uh, was generally uh, made by um, a character um, really artistic in a way. Uh, for example, I'm a huge fan of Nikola Tesla and uh, it's easy to understand that this uh, character was a kind of artist, but with a very strong uh, scientific uh, capacity and he was able to make real uh, his dream but any scientific discovery is made in a very uh, subjective way um, people decide to look for something in one field in one very specific direction and this decision is really personal and not scientific and not rational so i like this kind of oscillation between um, pre-science, para-science, and science. Uh, 
for this project in Tarbes, I work with real frequencies that I'm uh, uh, spreading with another artwork. I think it's another picture um, with some uh, sphere in, uh, in glass that you have somewhere. Yes. Um, the, the next, uh, maybe yes. Thank you very much. So this is um, a completely uh, free uh, inspiration. Um, um, it's uh, about the Schumann resonance and uh, uh, Schumann discovered or he had the intuition that the earth was generating a very specific uh, frequency, 7.83 hertz. And uh, it's really interesting because a lot of people believe that uh, it's really helpful to generate this frequency in their home. So they start to build machine and to uh, construct some strange objects. So I like this uh, system where you have a belief, an aesthetic, a machine, and a creation. This is my own personal <laughs> machine to generate this frequency. Um, and uh, I'm not using for myself. I just like to collect stories, to collect mythologies, to um, also, I created this object at the time I was doing my project for the Sydney Biennial. And it was really interesting for me to uh, discover that around us in a very uh, rational uh, society, like in France, we are really uh, supposed to be really rational. And uh, uh, you have a lot of um, alternative practice and, and a lot of objects made by people with uh, certain beliefs, like the, the Steiner sculptures that we saw before. <laughs> Another thing I want to ask you is um, about the notion of newness, because I know that you're very interested in new technologies at the moment when they're new, but they're also interested in new technologies which have been new, but are now old. So how, how do you deal with the newness, so to speak, of technology and how do you include it in your art? Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Donatien. Um, actually, uh, I think that um, when a new type of picture and is uh, invented and made possible by a new uh, technology, um, it generates something, uh, a kind of new activation in our brain. Uh, because um, like when we started to do movie with drones, it was something completely surreal and completely new. And our brains were not ready to understand quickly uh, these images. And it was for an artist really interesting. So I started to do movie with drones like uh, 20 years ago. And uh, it was uh, something for me, uh, it was a way to uh, put the viewer in a new situation and to activate a new kind of connection in the brain of the viewer. So I think that the, the new tools allow um, the artist uh, to create new kind of picture, new kind of, um, and it's, it changed our uh, state of mind in a way, because we are put in front of pictures that we are not used to, to see, like the LiDAR, the fact that you can uh, cross an object and this transparency is something completely new. Of course, in two years, you will see uh, in any kind of advertising uh, the use of this technology, and it won't be as interesting than now. It's not to look the new for the new, but it's more, or for an artist, it's possible to use uh, in an interesting way uh, this, uh, this technology. Another question I want to ask you is, um, when I look at a work of art, I always wonder about the state, what needs to be in to experience it. And for me, oftentimes, your art is made to be experienced while being high, while being on drugs. 
while being in psychotics, psychotropics, psycho, psychotropes, sorry. So how, do you think, do you think your art is made to be experienced while being high by the audience? And do you get high while making it? No, um, I think that uh, the good news is that you don't need to take drugs to, to ex experience um, art. And that's great because uh, I think that even in a scientific way today, we are understanding um, all is uh, the perception of a, a work of art and how it's possible and how it changed our uh, brain connection. So I think it's really interesting. Um, I, in, the new, uh, in the new book uh, I will publish about my work, there is a, a, a very interesting um, writing by Arnaud Pierre about the hypnotic, uh, the, the hypnose and my work, you know. So um, for different reasons, I have been interested by um, the way an artwork or an installation change the state of mind of a viewer. Uh, first of all, because it also refers to uh, the political um, uh, question of all today, as a citizen, we are influenced by different forces and all we are crossed by different flux and um, all we can deal with that, you know, because today it's so complex and uh, we are not in, um, uh, we are not in our Western um, uh, countries, uh, we are not facing um, a kind of uh, direct and strong power. We have this feeling to be free, but in the meantime, uh, we have to understand how complex is the world uh, and the society around us. And um, I think that uh, I try with my work to deal with this complexity and to understand, uh, like, for example, I think the cinema industry is a very strong uh, tool of power. And it's really interesting to analyze how we are changed by the cinema industry. So. Yes, this kind of um, aspect of an artwork are uh, really uh, uh, for me important. So as I said before, um, um, an artwork for me is not just an object or a decorative object. It's also something um, generating this different kind of signal, information, uh, sensorial, invisible signal. So. Um, uh, this is the way I see an artwork today. It's not just an object, it's something with a kind of um, radiation. I want to ask you also about knowledge. You know, you talk about investigating situation. There's a, your relation to new technologies, always developing new technologies and your relation to history and the fact that Laurent, I've been experiencing it for four years, you're an amazing nerd. So you're very fascinated with knowledge. Do you see that, is the work a tool for knowledge for you? Do you want it to be a tool of knowledge for others? And what sort of knowledge would it be the tool of? Um. I think that uh, what I like is that uh, in one of my exhibition, uh, there is a first uh, visual and uh, very uh, direct uh, impression. I like that uh, we are first uh, cooked by something uh, sensorial and visual. I like also the fact that in the contemporary art world, it's possible to get information or to get the knowledge that you mentioned uh, through the text, through the different books, and also today uh, online. It's very easy to understand what the work of an artist and uh, what he's dealing with, what kind of concept he's dealing. So um, 
thus uh, th th this knowledge um, is a kind of uh, again a constellation of different sources of information that the viewer can decide to uh, look for but it's not necessary uh, the work of art as first to give the desire the viewer uh, to to know more about it and um, of course, uh, for me, each project is a new starting point for myself to investigate a new field, to be in touch with a new tools, as I said before, but also with um, different kind of uh, researchers and uh, to uh, activate this uh, ongoing uh, discussion with different, uh, with different people. One thing that's not very often discussed in your work, and I think it's, it's something that is actually very interesting, is the role of politics uh, in your work. I mean, you famously made a film, which was a huge hit in France, which even went on mainstream TV, which is very rare for a non-film, of course, on the desk of the president of the Republic, French president of the Republic. You also made uh, a work, a series of works, you know, based on the society of control and the idea of panoptis and the idea of watching everything and us being watched. And you were sort of touching upon that. And at the same time, you're somebody whose work is unbelievably generous. And I think also a lot about your public art, so to speak. And you could say that the film at the Musée d'Orsay, to an extent, is public art. And it's and just to see the reaction of audiences to your art, which is so powerful and emotional and personal, you cannot see the desire or that ability to create a form of openness as political. So where, what do you see, how political is your art, basically? Uh, we could see one public project um, called Solar Wind, uh, Nick, I don't, it's, um, yes, the towers, uh, 43. So, um, this is a project in, um, in Paris and it's a public project. Um, it's a kind of a barometer of the solar winds that I created in collaboration with, uh, four different uh, research program. And uh, daily we have uh, data of um, the sun activity. And um, through the little um, computer program, we are transferring this uh, data into uh, light and colors. And uh, for me, it was really interesting to uh, create this project because it was a way to make uh, to 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 have a kind of distance with all the subject uh, on uh, earth and also to show in a poetic way that we are also influenced by the solar wind and by some very uh, uh, like a very far uh, uh, invisible uh, waves um, the idea of the public project for me is uh, very important and is a kind of political statement because um, it's in another frame um, than the museum and the galleries. It's something free for everybody. And I have some messages each uh, month from people because um, it's really interesting because you have a uh, thousand of cars each day because it's in the periphery of Paris. And uh, it's a way uh, to share my project uh, out of the museum. So this is one, because you mentioned the public project. And um, for me, since, um, I, uh, since I, I start to exhibit my work after the art school, um, I decided to invest a lot of time uh, to create some public projects. Uh, about the political also interest and about this idea of power and control. Um, yes, I have done this project about the 
office of the French president, for example. Uh, we have a picture in um, the section uh, power and control, <laughs> the second picture of it. Yes, the 58. So um, in, in France, um, the, the, the power and the way uh, the power is located and the, the place where the French president and also the government uh, are working are very historical uh, places. So here, uh, <laughs> the, you can see the movie but the movie is shown in a museum in Ajaccio, Palais Fesch. So uh, what you see is not the, the video installation uh, is, uh, is showing the French uh, president office, but uh, what you see is a museum around it. And I decided to, to, to show this uh, movie in this uh, museum. So yes, for me, it has always been um, a very important uh, aspect of my work was to analyze uh, different type of institution and to have the access to uh, certain uh, places and um, uh, it was a very interesting uh, negotiation uh, with uh, the French president and the Elysee Palace to, to get the access, to have the access to the, the French president office. And even as a citizen, um, it's uh, very interesting to be able to understand um, the type of places, uh, where they work, and what's the influence of this. Uh, it's a kind of set, you know, it's, uh, because it's so strange, because it's really uh, old and um, it's really uh, dramatic. So, uh, yes, this is one of my projects, Elysee, about uh, this relationship between aesthetic and power. I want to ask you also about, you know, location uh, and and the location of each of your projects and the relation to the to the world. Because for me, I mean, your work is so many ways taking the site where it is and making and, and unraveling it in a way. And and for you know, for example, um, the exhibition at the Musée Fesch in Ajaccio, which is this extraordinary. Uh, you know, uh, Ren Italian uh, Renaissance 16th, 17th century uh, art collection, uh, you know, was a way for you to deal with our history. When you did, went to, when you did your project Otto at the Sydney Biennial, it was a way for you to deal with the land and the sacred land of, 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 uh, of Australia. When you did your project um, at the Ballet Tokyo uh, Nomia, which is kind of a way of playing with the idea of a restaurant in Japan and putting it on the top of Ballet Tokyo, the location was at the center. And then of course, the project that you did, at the, I could go on and on, but the project that you did at the Musée d'Orsay is very much about bringing the world and images from the world into the space of the Musée d'Orsay. So in a way, it kind of leads me to this question, how important is the location? And connected to that, what is the world of Laurent Gasso? Uh, we could show a picture of uh, the, number two chapter of visualizing the invisible. Yeah. Yes, um, the 50, for example, or the 49. Because you mentioned uh, the project in uh, uh, in Australia, uh, we it's a bit connected with the, the the system that I created for my movie Elysee with the French President Office. The idea is that maybe one day we will understand that any location has a kind of power, a kind of radiation. And maybe one day we could measure this uh, radiation and uh, understand uh, why, for example, in Australia, uh, 
um, Aboriginal decided to, um, uh, uh, to, to consider that certain uh, location uh, were uh, sacred. And um, why uh, the president office is, locate, is located uh, in the Elysee uh, Palace. Uh, and um, for the project is in Sydney, uh, for, uh, in Cinema Inal, for my movie Otto, I, I went to the desert with different kind of tools. For example, here, um, it's a thermic camera. Um, so you can see uh, the picture with another uh, layer. But uh, we can also uh, show the, the picture just after. Um, I also created the, the sphere with special effect. And they are um, superimposed with different uh, location. In a way, uh, spheres uh, have been used in the history of art to represent generally the invisible. So, um, Yes, the location are really uh, important. It could be the, the places that we can see in my movie project, but it could be also the places where I'm exhibiting um, the, the project. In both situations, I try to analyze uh, uh, in different uh, ways um, the, 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 the location. I try to also work with the invisible part of uh, a place or uh, a location uh, again. Um, and what I like also about this idea of invisibility is uh, the new project that we are planning to do together, um, Spectral Orsay. And we could show a few pictures. Um, Spectral Orsay, it's at the beginning of uh, Yes. So this is really interesting because here, um, as I said before, we, we have made this new movie project, uh, Artificialis. And now uh, for this project, we use the uh, LiDAR uh, scanner to do different kind of flowers of uh, also uh, the ice flow and uh, some uh, different forests. And here, we use the same uh, technology, but to document my exhibition at Musée d'Orsay. So um, you can see this uh, transparency is really interesting. And also, uh, a bit after, we can see a very uh, famous uh, sculpture of Carpo um, just at the end. Yes. Yes, the last one, yes. And maybe the next picture. So this is for me really interesting because you can see uh, through the material. And this is exactly the new type of uh, images that I describe, described uh, before. I think that for, uh, of course, art historians are already using different kind of uh, X-ray and uh, very uh, complex uh, system uh, to analyze uh, uh, the different uh, sculpture and painting uh, in the collection of famous museum. But here, I think that uh, the, the strangeness of this transparency is really interesting. And this is just one still uh, with the virtual camera that uh, we will program, we uh, will go through the material and through the stone of the sculpture. I want to ask you maybe two more questions, Laurent. Uh, one is about uh, abstraction, because in a way you were showing these images from your film Otto and they look like the patterns of colors are creating almost an abstract shape. And you find that quite a lot in the film here, the Musée d'Orsay Artificialis, and you could say that it's a central point uh, in all your art. What, what do you see as being the role of abstraction in your work? I think that uh, abstraction is uh, uh, one of the layer uh, of 
uh, one uh, image. And um, for myself, as I said, I try to use the different layer and the different component element of one picture. So um, this idea of um, a kind of sensorial uh, perception of my work is uh, really important. And I like this idea that uh, the content and the subject remains something important. So in a way, I try to mix um, the content and uh, the information with the abstract part uh, of uh, one uh, image in my movie project, for example. Uh, so, and plus I try to use uh, the, the soundtrack, for example, is really important. Uh, maybe we could uh, we could show an excerpt of the artificialist movie. Um, the one with the uh, with the fire. Six. Yes, I'm pulling this up right now. You can see some. Uh, it's a white landscape. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, yes. So here uh, we created this uh, kind of uh, strange uh, lightning inside of the ice. And um, the sound also, uh, as I said, very, uh, very important because it puts the viewer in a certain state of mind. In the meantime, uh, you can understand that something is going on, something strange, and it's a way to um, amplify some important uh, question of uh, today. Um, because artificialist is also about uh, the post-Anthropocene uh, moment um, where we are. And um, so, as I said, in the same picture, you have this information, but you have the soundtrack, you have the special effect, adding uh, a kind of a surreal um, moment. So, yeah, I don't know if it's, uh, if it answers well to your question, Donatien, but... Uh, well, it does in, in your own ways of, you know, transforming the question. I'll, I'll have one last question, um, you know, which is um, you, when I see your work, um, it makes me think of a dreamscape, you know, and it seems to me that you make images uh, that are, um, you know, dreams in their own way and that are these images from dreams and it kind of makes me think of that famous quote from a song i try to believe in dreams although it's only fantasy and that for me is a good way to encapsulate what your art is trying to highlight how do you feel about it yeah this is uh, really interesting because uh, when we uh, have to decide what kind of uh, camera motion we want it to use for the LiDAR uh, scanner. Um, it's a moment where you have a virtual camera and you can program, uh, you can monitor the camera and uh, you, you, it's possible to do whatever. Um, and um, actually, I just understood uh, two days uh, ago, uh, I was discussing with uh, the director of Quai Branly in Paris, and uh, he told me that the forest picture of my project Artificialis um, reminds the dream of a forest and the, the memories of a forest that we, uh, we have. And I thought that, yes, in a way, when you have the choice, when it's completely free, um, of course, um, in a way, you will produce something that you already know. So I understood that I was uh, producing uh, videos of um, my dreams, in a way, 
uh, I, I was reproducing um, the way we are uh, representing uh, ourselves um, uh, a motion in a forest um, by doing this uh, LiDAR uh, movie. So also, I think that um, what, can what can produce an artwork um, is this moment where you are uh, in this, um, so I, I don't know the name in English, uh, Donatien, uh, Rêve Éveillé, this kind of awake uh, dream. Uh, it's a, you're, called a dream state. Yeah. So I like this moment. And I think that um, the, the movie and my movie installation, they attempt to produce this state of mind. And for example, I can feel, I can find the same kind of uh, impression um, when I'm uh, at the opera or in a contemporary uh, dance uh, uh, show or in a concert, you know? Uh, it's a kind of way and back between your thought and what you are. Uh, you, there, there is a kind of uh, brain connection activated and it allows you to uh, analyze, to dream, to think. And in the meantime, uh, you, you are completely connected with um, the, the artwork or the, the show. So I like this kind of moment. And uh, this is a... This is what I try to produce with uh, my, my project. Thank you so much, Laurent, for this conversation. Um, it was a privilege for me to have it with you and with all of you. And now before we end our introduction to Sandra's reading, uh, if you have any uh, question uh, to Laurent, feel free to ask, of course. Yes, uh, this is where I will come back in. I want to thank you both so much for this wonderful conversation today. Um, it really is a treat for those of us that are over here on the other side of the ocean to see these images and um, thank you both. So I'm gonna go right into it. Um, first, I'm gonna hand the mic over to uh, GE. GE, I'm going to pass to you the mic. Thank you. What a privilege this has been. And, and in so many rhizomatic different directions of wonderful ideas and everything. My question is, is kind of simple, but maybe it isn't. Do you see yourself as kind of a broker between the pure and the applied? I mean, you're talking about, you know, moving between dreams and coming back again and presenting the information maybe from those places and everything. I, I just wonder if you could speak to that. Thank you. No, so unmute you yourself. Just, you just have to turn your mic. Sorry. <laughs> um, what uh, could you repeat the question? Sorry. Uh, simply, simply put, do you think of yourself as kind of a broker between the pure? that that other place and and the applied um, for for example for the project artificialist we we deal with the concept of nature and uh, the idea that the nature uh, is a concept and that today um, human being uh, are um, in a way, uh, more uh, they are not. Um, there is no distanciation or uh, separation between what we call nature and human being. Um, for different kind of project, uh, I have been um, facing this idea. For example, um, uh, in Australia, when I had the privilege to do this project with uh, an Aboriginal community, um, I understood that um, this very uh, Western idea of a kind of communion with nature is not, it's absolutely not the way uh, it is. Um, I think that uh, for uh, different communities, 
um, a landscape, a mountain is part of the family. And it's not something where it's not something out of you. It's something part of the community as a kind of member. And that a very that was a very interesting um, discovery. And for me, it helped me a lot to 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 do my project and to understand better, and to understand also by different scientists are working. Uh, for example, also uh, Descola. A French uh, anthropologist is uh, working a lot on this topic that uh, the, dis the difference uh, between nature and culture doesn't exist anymore. Um, so yes, I try to uh, investigating, uh, to, sorry, to investigate this, uh, uh, this new situation where we have to, to, to change um, uh, our way to, to, to see the, the reality. Thank you. Thank you, GE and Lamont. Uh, next, I'm going to pass the mic over to our friend Lynn Crawford. Lynn, you're next. You should be able to Hi. turn on that. Thank there you. you are. Let's see if I can remember my question. It, this has been so interesting. I've, Let's see I've if I can that since then. But I was very interested in um, you saying that you were trying to activate your brain in a way, or a brain to um, envision something in the future. Is that, is that accurate? Uh, sort of doing certain technical things um, so you could, to, you know, to, to visit possible futures or possible things in the future? I think that uh, um, any artist and uh, it could be writer or uh, any kind of artist as this, uh, dream to be able mm -hmm. to visualize the right. future and to help and it's really interesting because uh, we just spent one year in a very strange moment and um, a lot of uh, writers <laughs> were able to uh, uh, describe this situation or to visualize um, so, and uh, what I think is really interesting today is that uh, the reality is uh, more strange than the science fiction uh, in a way, you know, it goes yeah. always, uh, <laughs> it's I... always more surprising and uh, the, 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 the science fiction um, is, uh, is, is start to be a bit uh, uh, weak uh, compared to uh, the kind of uh, situation we we have to face. Well, my question is, um, do you ever think that same way um, somehow to try to access a past, for example, um, possibly lost knowledge or, you know, the wisdom of plants or, you know, things that people knew at a certain point, um, you know, being able to read the stars, you know, and I'm wondering if you in any way conflate those two as equally inaccessible in a way and equally accessible, or do you look at them as different? Like the deep past and the future, are they accessing both of them? How do you? I think that um, I, I, I work a, a bit like an anthropologist. I, I like to investigate the beliefs of the different, uh, of different people. And uh, I like to understand what kind of stories people are telling themselves to survive in a way. Um, and um, about the past, the present, and the future, I saw when I start to um, create some uh, project and uh, uh, to, 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 to when I start my practice, I saw that the time and the notion of time was the new medium, the new material, and a kind of artistic uh, material to, to, to work with. After the space and the idea of installation in the 20th century, uh, the work of art um, went uh, out of the frame and started to uh, fill the space. Um, I think the 21st uh, century uh, one of the interesting uh, topic is uh, the use of time uh, 
by the artist. And this idea also uh, that you can find um, in different scientific uh, theories, like the string theory, where you have the, it's of, of course, it's a, it's a theory, but you have this idea of uh, multiple existing universe, uh, the idea that the time, uh, the time frame is uh, more complex than what we imagined before. So for an artist, you know, I use whatever I can to uh, create artwork and to be inspired. And um, I like this uh, uh, situation where, um, as I said before, with the new kind of tool we have today, we can produce new kind of images and it's really interesting, but also with all the different new scientific theories, it's possible to see the real, the reality in a new way. And that's really interesting because it activates some uh, new connection in our brain. And yes, uh, the present is maybe not the present and maybe it's possible to uh, travel. And the idea of traveling through time is really important in my work. This is the reason I created this series of painting studies into the past, where since 10 years, I mix some elements from my movie in certain background of the 16th, 17th, 18th century. And I try to uh, mix different temporalities uh, to, together. So, yeah, <laughs> thank, thank you for your question. Thank you. Fascinating. Thank you both. Uh, next, I'm going to pass the mic over to Joshua. Joshua, you can turn on your mic now. Thanks, Nick. Thanks, Laurent, for um, showcasing your work. Great. I um. So, I got here a little bit late. My apologies, Laurent. But you know, tuning in, you know, what I'm saying it's super, super um, awesome. <laughs> okay, so my question is, um, like, with your artwork, okay, we noticed, um, like the like the oscillator earlier, right? The scientific machine, Laurent. Yeah, which which machine? The the one with the the with the bells. With the bells. The day we yeah. Yeah, it look like bells. I'm sorry about that. I think that's the Steiner one in in, in copper. Yeah. So, um, as you was mentioning, um, wow, I learned so much. I'm just attempting to connect it, Lauren. I need your help with this one. Okay. So, uh, excuse me. So, the 7.83 hertz. Does this machine run off of that 7.83 hertz? Also. Do you conduct like your installations along with certain geographical locations, uh, similar to like um, how telluric current works? I'm not sure if you know what telluric current is. Uh, no. Telluric current is basically the current that uh, travels telluric, through yeah, the yeah, yeah. telluric uh, current. No, no, sorry. Excuse me. Yes, I know. Okay, so. Do you um, like organize your exhibitions on certain geographical locations to maybe collect the telluric current? Or like does your machine like kind of like coincide with a geographical location a longitude or latitude, Laurent? Yeah, so um, uh, it's funny that you mentioned the telluric uh, current because the place uh, where I've exhibited last week, it was the opening of the first show I was able to attend because after one year, uh, we did a lot of uh, opening by Zoom. Um, I went to Tarps and the place of the exhibition is located on the Greenwich Meridian. Uh, and um, it was really interesting because of the subject of my project and uh, this idea of um, frequency of the hearse. Um, yes, uh, I think that, uh, um, as I said before, 
most of the time strange uh, and important uh, discoveries in science uh, started with something really uh, uh, <laughs> really strange and uh, not really uh, serious you know uh, so um, it's uh, it's really interesting to to see what people are looking for and what kind of beliefs and um, I try to investigate uh, what is interesting to bring from other practice to the art world. In a way, uh, Jean-Hubert Martin, in a show um, called Magicien de la Terre in France, starts this work of collecting different kinds of practices, not named as art, uh, but really important and sometimes much more interesting as well. Uh, so for me, an artwork has to be magical, has, has to be um, political, magical, sensorial. And um, I like this idea of the power of an artwork and that the, the, the object uh, as a kind of force, as a kind of um, radiation, as I said before. So thank you very much for your, your question. Thank you both. I think that that's a, a new concept for many of us to learn. Uh, uh, what was the word? Uh, sorry. Thank you, Josh. <laughs> um, uh, well, our friend in the audience, Jacob Bromberg, asked a question, but um, I'm not sure if I think he asked if I could read this on his behalf. So uh, for Laurent. Um, Jacob Bromberg asked, he is interested to know if you use the prism of radiation when making your artwork, and if so, or, and if so, how? Um, for, for the work we have shown before with the spheres in glass, um, we bought a little uh, generator of uh, frequencies uh, able to spread exactly the 7.83 Earth's uh, frequency. So um, uh, we also did some uh, testing with uh, engineers to uh, prove that uh, the artwork was uh, safe. <laughs> uh, and it is. <laughs> so um, as an artist, it's interesting to work with this invisible uh, material. Uh, the idea to fill the space with waves, with uh, frequencies, is also, as I said before, with the notion of time, it's also a new way to make exhibition, you know, with because uh, I like to catch the invisible through the different tools I describe it, but I, I, I like also to, to use um, the invisible uh, waves and frequency to, to fill the space as a kind of new medium. Well, thank you so much. Um, I'm going to pass the mic over now for our final question of the day, uh, over to the Wales' own Fong H. Bui. Fong, you um, have the floor. Thank you so much, Nikki. Thank you, Laurent. Thank you, Fang, for this invitation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dan Xian. And uh, it's nice to see you both. I'm sorry I was in and out because of interruption with phone call and whatnot. But I overheard um, the last question of Dan Xian, who wrote, who raised the question about the condition of dreams, dreamlike or in dreamscape in your work, which I can't help but to think of one of our most important philosophers in regarding to dreams, bravery, among all the things which is also contribute to his massive um, link between what was missing in art and science, namely Gaston, uh, Gaston Bachelard. And it, you know, we know about his dialectic notion of duration in terms of between the measure time you know, time that it can be measured like clock, and then lift time, uh, which is perpetually uncatchable. So my question uh, is, what is your notion of time? You know, because <laughs> I, 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 when I see your work, I, I know that there's time when I can suspend it. Um, why experience it? 
completely, re, you know, completely removed from because of the whole entire the senses being confronted by the experience. So the sense of time is really removed uh, because it's so immersive. So I'm just trying to figure out to ask you what, how do you mediate between that? There's a duration of time, you know, and then the time that is incredibly ephemeral, cannot be captured, cannot be put in between duration. Thank you. <laughs> yes, um, I see my uh, installation uh, uh, as a time capsule. Uh, I like this idea that at least one uh, installation, one exhibition could um, remove you for your own time in another <laughs> time, in another temporality, and to allow you to, as I said before, when you are in front of uh, an opera or a dance uh, ballet or whatever, it's uh, a kind of uh, suspension uh, uh, and uh, it's a kind of treasure uh, today because uh, um, we are always um, connected, we are always um, crossed by different information and uh, we have to learn again to um, uh, be more uh, to, to 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 slow uh, the, the the time frame where we are uh, navigating. Mm -hmm. So for me, um, I think that I have this test to create this kind of moment um, where, uh, strangely, since twenty 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 years, I'm producing movie and uh, people stay in front of them. <laughs> so I'm very happy because uh, it's very difficult to uh, catch the attention of the viewer in, a, it's, not in a, it's not in a cinema theater, you know, it's in, a, in an exhibition space. So moving pictures in an exhibition space, uh, it's, an art, it's an art job to, to keep the viewer in front of the in front of the, the project. Um, so it's uh, because there is no um, narration, uh, actors, <laughs> famous actors, or yeah. uh, any kind of uh, seduction uh, of this uh, cinema industry. So um, I'm very happy and uh, uh, that even the first exhibition I've made, we found a friend of mine. He was sleeping uh, at the end of the day. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I, I thought, okay, I'm, I'm doing a good job. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Fong and Laurent. Um, at The Rail, we have a tradition of ending our community events with a poetry reading, and I'm thrilled to welcome our Poet Laureate of the Day, Sandra, to the stage. Uh, poet and critic Sandra Simons is the author of seven books of poetry, most recently Atopia from Wesleyan University Press. Her poems have been included, included in Best American Poetry in 2014 and 2015, and have appeared in The New Yorker, Poetry Magazine, The American Poetry Review, the Chicago Review, among many others. She lives in Tallahassee, Florida, and is an associate professor of English and Humanities at Thomas University and Thomasville, Georgia. Uh, tuning in from the beach, Sandra, I am passing the mic over to you. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah? Oh, good, Perfect. okay. I really enjoyed that um, talk. Um, uh, Laurent, I, I was, I, I guess I'm allowed to comment. Um, I thought that spectral or say was really interesting um, because of the time. So like the way that you use technology and, and time, you know, the work with time so that the past, it's like the, spec, the specter, the ghosts of the past kind of coming out of the, 
of the um, sculpture. So I thought that was quite interesting. And I hope you don't take offense to this, but I thought that it was almost looked like mold or some sort of, you know, spores or something like underlying the um, the, the white. Uh, it, was, it was quite interesting. I, I thank you for sharing your work. I, um, I quite, quite enjoyed that. Yeah. Um, I think we're all trying to, to contend with the 19th century idea of, of nature, uh, and most poets are. So um, anyway, I'm gonna read, um, I'm gonna share my screen because I'm gonna read two poems and they're in three columns. And so they're a bit unusual and I think it'd be a, a little bit easier to follow them if they're on the screen. Um, can I do that? Can I, I think I'm able. You should be able to. Yeah, yeah, yes. okay. This, there we are. Okay, can you see this poem? Yeah. Okay, yes. good, good. Okay, um, so um, the, this word um, oneirogenic, when I come to it, uh, it means like a plant that can produce dreams. So I know we we're talking about dreams. So it's like a interesting word that I enjoyed. Okay, um, the way that I read this is the first column, the second column, and then the third column. So <clears throat> on Riverside, on Avondale and Riverside, past the marble house, full of punctuation and plants, deep where the tornado untwines its watch. What did you want, Valentine? In the shrine of sunshine, I lift my hoodie over my life, pain scale four, thought your hands were pressed to my face, but I am walking into a glass window. You in Washington, prismatic, but no water. Is this landlocked person real? I asked my phone synapses, strengthened by weed, astrology, therapy, and the mute button. You call from the Capitol and I throw my phone into the St. John's River again. It's okay, you're used to it. Let's get fucked up and forget the pandemic. Forget the homicidal pantomimes where those pretty pretties on screens where you're supposed to enact plenitude but sink so far into the orchestration of money and shit. How long will I walk away into these lush hours, the ones unspent into, in togethers incarnadine never did take the olive tree out of its bucket. The leaves slowly fell off and I felt awful, didn't have the heart to garden or compost songs or disease, long lists of foods I can and cannot eat, the physical aspects crumbling, weight loss, mysterious appearances, a blue dress hanging from a low cloud, makeup turning up in my mailbox shaped like a college, cottage, all the wrong colors, but still applied them diligently, touched down on Mars, the mailbox collapsed, a seventh grader biking down the street was jumped by three kids. I said, do you want some water? He was crying. I thought, don't look at me like that. Please don't look at me like that. Like what? Like an animal. It is the white flower that roars, orneogenic, a catastrophic tryst with undulating cumulonimbus clouds, the dripping of water from a fawn-shaped fountain, happenstance in green, someone vacuum cleaning their living room on a Sunday, Oh, love, I don't want to see them anymore. The ghosts of my life, of yours. Can't our together, togetherness short circuit, but no. The refinery wavers. The men trickle out with their lunch boxes. The salt air chemicals sting, sting, sting. It is not a dream. It is everything you hope to forget, but couldn't. It is splashed blood on the boardwalk across from the oceanic feeling you say you've never experienced. Well, I have, I do, every day. I'm sorry I can't help you. I don't know how to speak the language of the dead. This is the third, third column. Why do men have to kill the women they can't have in poems? 
like Richard Hugo's The Lady in Kicking Horse Reservoir. Even as sublimation, a sickness, a devouring and devaluing, like that guy who tells you, I love you, I love you, I love you. And why do the women in the 1980s creative writing workshop nod along to his stupid story? No, you don't love me, dickhead. You just want your hands to turn to weeds so they can brush my dead face at the bottom of your lake. Okay, um, do I have time to read one more? Yes, no? Yes, okay. please. All right, um, let me find another one. Sorry, I read a whole book of these. Um, hold on, let's see. Okay, uh, so I, uh, I teach this book, The Bell Jar, which is the only novel by Sylvia Plath. You might be familiar with it. And I was um, reading it in the Everglades. So I wrote this poem about the, can you still see the screen? I think you can, yeah. Um, so uh, the main character is named Esther Greenwald in that novel. Um, reading the Bell Jar in the Everglades National Park. When Esther Greenwood is almost raped, why can't she connect what happened to her downward spiral from throwing designer clothes off the hotel balcony to her unwashed hair, electroshock therapy and worse. Slut, the, the guy kept saying, slut, 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 where's my diamond, slut? In sixth grade science class, there was a boy who liked to light the hair of girls on fire. The science teacher laughed, ha, ha, ha. She didn't believe us when we told her, ha, 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 until the smell of Heidi's burnt braid mixed with the chalk powder that fell off the enormous grave green board. It rained all day. Then I read your poetry. I lied twice. First when I told you I wasn't afraid of rain and then when I put it in a poem. So I unfolded the piece of paper where the poem was and wrote a true story, eight or 10 vultures on top of a Corolla pecking at the blue tarp the Everglades National Park provided their visitors. I texted Alex, vultures are the bird form of roaches. Then one looked at me, quote, there were vultures everywhere in the swimming pool, vomiting, shitting, blood, blood, blood. It was gross, said Mrs. Delamo, who bought a $700,000 vacation home in West Palm where the birds invaded. It wouldn't stop looking. All the other birds were pecking away at the blue tarp to get to the windshield wipers, which apparently give off the scent of a carcass when the plastic melts in the sun. Save me, save me, save me, I said to the vulture, but it wouldn't look away. My name is Esther Greenwood. Sometimes I get a bad idea and I follow through on it. That's the difference between me and other people. Other people get distracted by roasting a chicken or watching TV, but I am carnal. I know the difference between killing yourself and stepping down the spiral staircase into the cellar of the self, that really meaty stringy place wrapped in shadows, booming with an arterial pulse so that if you were to kill it, it would mean something. Now look at me. Look at the mirror I'm holding up. You can smash it. There's another face behind it and another one behind that. Just like stars, they're endless and stretch obliviously in their cold calculations. It is Christmas Eve, so go ahead, smash it. I'm sure someone out there is in love with me. Thank you. Snaps and claps. Thank you so much, Sandra. That was a perfect way to conclude today's conversation. Um, I'm so happy that your poetry complimented Laurent's work so well there. Um, I want to thank you all for attending. Thank you, of course, Laurent and Donation. 
Uh, thank you all for joining today. Uh, we do this every day at 1 p.m. So join us tomorrow for a radical poetry reading with Kyle Carrero Lopez, spotlighting Black and Palestinian solidarity with poetry read by Jessica Abugatas, Anais Duplan, Amutara James, Is Jones, and Fargo Nassim Tabaki. Uh, you can all now turn on your microphones and say hello and goodbye. And I hope you all have a good day. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sandra. It was fantastic. Thank, Thank you, Laurel. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, Sandra. Thank you, Sandra. Thank you, Thank you, Sandra. Thank you, 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 guys. Thank you, it was a wonderful, wonderful conversation. And wonderful conversation. So wonderful. Conversation. Facts. 100%. <laughs> Very Big dope. So great. And thank you for the reading, too. This is great. Wait to see you, Donna Jia. We have much to catch on. Whenever you want, Spong, as always. <laughs> Sandra. Sandra. Yes, hi. Would you join my creative writing class? I, I'd be delighted. Do you teach oh, one? I'm going to look you up or something. I got to find you. Go, okay. you, you. Google away. Google away, Joshua. We'll put the guy together, OK? Thank you right. so much. Yes. Thank, Thank you, you Gracias. Send it up courage and let's go have lunch. lunch. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Again.